tonight is Rosh Hashanah of the trees. And if you've ever been to Israel on even December 31st, you know how us Israelis, we celebrate, we take these little plastic hammers and smack each other over the head and spray people with these kind of things, foam. So now the trees all have these little things and they're all celebrating uh, their new year, which of course they're not. And actually it's kind of one of the things we're gonna to get to in the class, which is if you wanted to celebrate the trees, why wouldn't you do it when they're filled with fruit? Why would you wanna do it in the middle of the winter when they're all dead and gloomy? But to really drill down on this, I did prepare a kind of deep class. So I will try to make sure that uh, I keep it as simple as possible. But, you know, I just can't be what I'm not. What can I, I tried for many years to be what I'm not, but it, it just didn't work out. And, uh, you know, people come over sometimes into my class and say, wow, that's really amazing, but I have no idea what you said. So at least that way, you know, somebody said to me, had I known you in the 60s, I would have never taken LSD. I would have just listened to your classes. So I, I just know that at least the neshama hears, and that's probably the most important. But I really, when I give a class, I don't like to do uh, recycled vegetables. I really like to start with new material that I've never really done before. That way it's kind of a good exercise for me. And I feel that it gives kavod, honor to you, because, you know, you guys, you're the kli, you're the vessel that receives the Torah right now. So that makes you extremely holy and very precious and therefore it deserves tremendous kavod, and the Torah should be uh, delivered as a precious way as well. So if you have the sheets, if not, I'll just read the Hebrew and translate that into English. But what we're going to do is take a look at the three, there are more, but the three most classic verses in the Torah, in Chumash, that deal with trees. So the first one is right off the start, in the creation of the world, as is narrated in the Torah, and I'm sure everybody knows this, that the story of Bereshit Bara Elohim, in the beginning God created the world, is not at all the way the world was created. It's not. It's not a, this happened and this happened and this happened. It's not what's going on. It's, and I can give you as an example, it says in the very first verse, God created the earth. But we know the earth wasn't created until many days later. So we also know that the word Bereshit does not mean in the beginning. It means at the helm, in the head, Rosh, at the head of importance. The whole purpose of creation was to create Shemayim and then Aretz. And then Aretz ultimately would welcome Shemayim and it would become one and the same, as we say in Kriya Shema, that they will be like the Yolk Shemayim Al Aretz. But that's the purpose of creation. Nonetheless, inside the creation, inside of this narration, there are two stories of creation. And if you look carefully in the Chumash, you'll understand this. The first one is what opens up. And if you look at the first Pusik, if you have it there in Hebrew at least, you'll notice there it says, Vayome Elohim, and God said, and this is referring first to the grasses of the earth, Hashem commanded the grasses, the herbs of the ground, which is kind of cool looking at this picture of Moy and the corn coming up. It's like you're seeing it like halacha lamaisa. It's really happening. And then it says, zera pri, pri lemino, etc., etc., etc. And then God commanded the trees that the trees should be fruit bearing trees and bring fruit into the, into the world. But the first thing I want to point out is if you notice when it uses the name of God, it only uses the name Elohim. If you look at the second verse, which you have to skip over the Rashi for a minute, the second verse, which comes in chapter 2, verse 9, there it says, Hashem Elohim min ha that God caused to create, to uh to grow rather from the ground. Call eights. Now, I'm going to translate this so that it makes sense. But it, it's not supposed to make sense. But I'll do that so at least we can understand it. Call ha'etz means that all of the trees, the trees should now be nechmad limorad. They should be beautiful in their appearance. Betov lemaichel and good for eating, etc. So you notice there, the first time the Torah talks about creation, it only uses the name Elohim. 
The second time it repeats the story of creation, and now it's always a double name, Hashem Elohim. And I'm sure you're familiar with this. Elohim represents the name of God of judgment, again, in a very broad sense. And the name Hashem represents God as Rachamim, as mercy. So when God created the world, God realized that the world would not be sustained on din. Human beings, as we'll see in this class, are not able to stand up to din. We're just not able to be perfect. Guess what? That should be no surprise. However, therefore, Hashem, I mean, God, put the name Hashem together with Elohim to temper it so that there would be rachamim in the din. So there would be opportunities to make mistake and not get zapped right away but rather that we have a window to fix and do tikkun and to do tshuva rather than suffering from whatever, whatever mistakes we might have made. Okay, it's important to keep this in mind because we're going to ask a whole bunch of questions now. And I really hope you don't fall asleep because then you'll never hear the answers. And then you'll just always wonder what those questions were forever. But if you do happen to stay up, I think you're going to find it really cool because it's kind of... I almost sure it's very different than anything you may have ever heard before. So let's start going now back to the first pasuk. In the first pasuk, it says there, and Hashem said to the, to the uh, grasses, the herbs, that they should grow. And then in terms of the tree, which is what we're looking at, it says, Eitz pre, ase pre limino, that the fruit tree should make fruit of its kind, right? An orange tree should not grow watermelons. Orange trees should grow oranges, and lemon trees should grow lemons, in this simple translation. However, if you then look at how the verse continues in the next verse, which is in the verse number 12, suddenly it says, after Vayikain, and it was, it says, Desha Esa Mezera Zera Liminayo, the herbs or the grasses went ahead and they grew their own type. And then it says, Ve'etz, Asepri, and the trees made fruit. So you should have it, you should see there right away that in the first verse, the tree is called an eights pre, and all of a sudden, by the next verse, the word pre is gone. It's no longer called an eights pre, it's only called an eights, which is a sapri, a tree that makes fruit. Again, the first verse says that it should be a fruit tree that makes fruit. And the second verse is, it should be a tree that makes fruit. And this, as you'll see right there, bothers Rashi. So Rashi jumps up and gives us what seems to be a simple explanation, because that's what Rashi's job is. But if, God forbid, you were to think about it, it'd blow your mind. Like, what? But we'll get there. First, let's unblow and then blow, okay? So first, Rashi starts off like this. Shehi tama eitz kitama pri. God said that the taste of the tree itself, like if you went over and bit into a orange tree, it should taste like orange. I guess if you know, like maple syrup, if you put a little spigot into an orange tree, you should get orange juice. It shouldn't just be that the oranges taste like orange, but even the tree should taste like orange. And then Rashi continues, and the trees didn't do that. Ella, rather, they just simply came into the world, meaning, the tree produced fruit, but not that the trees would itself be a fruit. Therefore, when man sinned, now remember, chronologically, there was no man, because he only and she only shows up on Friday, and here we're talking about a few days before that, when man were, was to sin, uh, then the punishment at that moment would also extend to the trees, and they would also be kilkal, broken. Now, what? Trees have free will? Seriously, you know, God says to the tree, bum, 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 and the trees say, mm, I don't think so. I mean, 
What's going on here? A, right? H how could a trees possibly not do what they were told to do? Only human beings have the ability to commit spiritual suicide and not listen to God. But how could a tree possibly do that? And not only how could the tree possibly do it, but what does it mean that their punishment for doing wrong, which is impossible to understand because trees have no sense of right or wrong, why would it be dependent on the future sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? Well, for example, what would have happened if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned? Then what? I mean, it's if somebody made a very outrageous, blasphemous, but still outrageous uh, cartoon once about what happened if Adam and Eve didn't sin. It was actually quite cute. It's a little cartoon, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. There's God and there's a little, you know, snake. And God says, don't you eat of that fruit. And Adam says, okay, no problem. Won't eat. And God's like, what? Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to eat. You said don't eat? I'm not going to eat. God said, hey, I said don't eat. Yeah, yeah, I hear you loud and clear. I'm not going to eat. Don't, it's never going to happen. Don't worry. Anyhow, long story short, this cartoon, God comes back to visit like the earth, like, I don't know, 400 years later, and there's nowhere to stand because there's zillions of people because there's no death, right? Because since they didn't eat the fruit, nobody died. So there's everybody's being born, but nobody's dying. There's like no more room left on the earth. Anyhow, that's just an interesting little cartoon. But the question is, what if Adam had not sinned? What then? What then? What would have been with the trees? So I'm going to build up these questions, and the class is going to drill down on these. So first of all, it's crazy, crazy that the trees have a will of their own and could resist doing what God said. Second of all, what does it mean that the tree itself should taste like the fruit? And so it doesn't. Big deal. Why is that like everybody getting bent out of shape? And third, why is it being dependent on Adam? Again, maybe Adam wasn't great. Adam's supposed to at least have free will, and maybe he would not have sinned. Okay, going a little bit further, we find out, and we're going to see this much more in depth, that guess what? This whole world is a sting operation. This is a police sting. We have been set up for failure. All of creation has been designed that man, meaning human, not male, including male, should fail. It's an amazing thing. And we're going to see it based on Gomorrah's. We're going to see it based on the writings of King David and King Solomon. And we're also going to see it in the Zohar as well. And we're going to understand why that is. But right now, we can go a step even before this bizarre story with the trees. And let's go back to the sun and the moon. Because Tu B'Shvat is a full moon. Right? So what happens? We all know the story. Moon comes over to God. It says, um, excuse me, Mr. God, sir, God, uh, but like, hello, like they're like, hello, two lights out there. Uh, and how can you have two lights at the same time, the sun and the moon? And God goes, oh, yeah, you know, Taka, you're right, you're right. And the moon, honey, I shrank the moon, right? The moon gets shrunk. Really? Think about that. I mean, everybody knows the story. I'm sure it's not the first time you heard the story. But did you ever stop to think how crazy the story is? Really? God needed the moon to point out there's a problem in creation because there's two lights? I mean, I don't know if you guys ever watch Monty Python movies, but if you ever saw Life of Brian, you'll remember that the little midgets, I'm uh, sorry, time bandits, you'll remember that the little midgets would hop through different times because since God created the world in six days, it was a shtickle of a rush job. So there are black holes in the universe that he wanted the little midgets who worked in the shrubbery department during creation to sew up the holes. If you haven't ever seen the movie, you got to see the movie. But is that really what happened? God like, you know, just, ha, ha, they got six days. Yeah, hey, quick, yeah, yeah, Jim, bam, boom, rivers. And I, I, I create, ah, ah, ah. What are you talking about? You talking about this is God, so God needed the moon to come over and say, "Que pasa, Señor?" What is that all about? And not only that, poor moon. So the moon opens its mouth; it gets zapped. 
That's how you say thank you? And let's say there was a problem. Let's say there really should not have been these two lights. So the moon, because it spoke up, gets punished for speaking up? Bizarre. So we're seeing a pattern. Right away, there was a certain idea of creation. And suddenly the moon gets shrunk. Two minutes later, so to speak, the trees are rebelling. And the tree's punishment is now being dependent on a sin that almost appears that it had to happen. Because that's what Rashi says. Rashi says, because when Adam will now sin, then the trees will also be punished. As if Adam had no free will. And what really is free will? And like the Rambam in this famous Mor Nuvuchim, the book called The Guide to the Perplexed, which my rabbi said actually used to call it the guide to become perplexed, even himself asked that question. How could it possibly be? How, I mean, the Rambam's famous question, if God is all powerful, can he not make something he cannot lift? So if God is setting up this whole world and this whole universe, why are there anywhere in the universe where there could be free will? Because free will almost suggests as if God doesn't know what we're about to do. We have free will. And if God does know, then how is that free will? Okay, keep those thoughts in mind for one minute. Now we're going to go to the third verse, and now we're going to get into the class. This is just preamble stuff. So the third verse, we have to jump all the way to the very end of the Torah, and now we're in Sefer Devarim, in the last book of the five books of Moses. And suddenly, I'll just give you the context, because I didn't want to write the whole paragraph, uh, but the context is talking about war. Jewish army has laid siege to an enemy city. Now, in those days, especially when you're fighting wars, wood was an extremely important commodity. First of all, you needed the wood to make fires to be able to feed your troops. You needed the wood to build various defense mechanisms. All kinds of things were the wood. And now imagine this. Imagine going back 3,000 years plus to the way wars were fought in the world. Imagine going to one of these giant empires, the Chitim, and telling the Chitim in the middle of their wars, hey, time out. Why are you cutting down trees? They'd look at you like you were crazy. So suddenly God comes along and tells the Jewish army that, you know what, guess what, guys? You are not allowed to cut down fruit trees because fruit trees bring life into the world. And therefore, you have to use the trees that do not produce fruit if you need wood, but you must be sensitive to not cutting down fruit trees. It's an amazing concept. I mean, it's a biblical concept, but where would it possibly have ever even come from? So then if you take a look at the, at the Pasuk, it says here, it says that, um, oh, wait, you know what? I got ahead of myself. I'm, I'm very sorry. I apologize. We, we didn't do the second verse before we got to the third one. So just hold that idea. Sorry. And come back for one minute to where it's the verse here in uh, chapter two, number nine. Still back into the Garden of Eden. Sorry. One more important approach. It says, Hashem Elohim. Again, now we're in the section of the creation where it's mercy and judgment together. Min adama, kol eitz nechmad limoreh, every tree that it should be beautiful in its appearance and good to eat. The eitzah chayim betochagan, and the tree of life was in the middle of the garden. The eitzadat tovara, and the tree of knowledge of good and bad. So the first thing we notice here is that the verse is no longer talking about a pre eights What happened to the whole idea of fruit and fruit trees? Second of all, why does it say call eights which would be literally translated to mean all tree. It should say all of the trees. It's singular. And why call eights all the tree? Like even the roots are going to be nice looking? I mean, you don't even see the roots. It's a funny kind of a way to say it, in, especially in Hebrew. And then not only that, it's not talking about fruit at all anymore. 
Rather, it's suddenly talking about its appearance, the way it looks. Somebody really cares how it looks? Do you really care? I mean, obviously, I'm not talking about if it looks not healthy. But do you really think that orange trees like go to like beauty pageants to compete which one's more beautiful? No, the only comparison they have is who produces the better oranges. You don't really care what a tree looks like. Why would that be important for God to point out that the trees should now look beautiful and they should also be desirable or good to eat? It's a funny kind of a phraseology. So, the, so these are like the key questions here. And the idea also here is, one more point, is that Rashi on this Pusik points on this verse points out that the tree of life, and, and, and later you'll see both trees actually, were in the center of the Garden of Eden. Is that important to you? If the tree was slightly northwest by two notches, would that make a difference? I mean, is, is Rashi giving us a little map so a treasure chest, just in case you ever happen to be traveling on the road, there's an exit to the Garden of Eden, you want to check it out, and now you're in there, you're looking for where the tree is. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember, it's in the middle. I mean, why is that important information? Why do you care that the tree of life was in the middle of the garden? I mean, it's enough just to know there's such a thing called the tree of life. And maybe it is important that it's in the garden, but does it really matter? that it's in the middle of the garden. I mean, Rashi doesn't waste his time or our time. Why does Rashi find that uh, mission critical to use the terminology, betoch, in the middle, means in the center of the garden. Okay, so keeping that in mind, let's just talk about for a minute what the Zohar says about these trees. The Zohar says that obviously, as we know from Einstein, Two things cannot occupy the same place at the same time. So therefore, the way to actually read the Pasuk is it's telling us that the tree of life and this other tree called the tree of knowledge of good and bad were both in the center. Therefore, the Zohar comes along and says it's the same tree. The tree had one common trunk, and then it branches into two separate trees. But the two trees are really one and the same tree. Now, that's really important to understand, that the two trees are really one and the same. And not only that, we find, now coming to what I mentioned before, the third reference, which is the one in Devarim. I apologize, I got ahead of myself and jumped there first. But there, it's talking about a war and seizing the city and not cutting down the fruit trees. And the Pasuk says there, why? Really strange. I mean, it talks about in case people need food to eat, but it says, Kia Adam because a man, a human being, is a tree in the field, which is really a kind of a, an amazing thought. How is a man like a tree in the field, and how is a human being compared to a tree? What is there in that comparison? So we have in the very first Tehillim, Psalms, written by King David, a beautiful comparison, which we're going to learn for a minute, the commentary of the Malbim on this particular verse. So the, in the third verse in Tehillim, uh, King David writes as follows. Which means that a Bahaya, and, and it's talking about human, man. Man will be like a palgi, uh, sorry, ke'ez uh, shatul, like a tree, shatul. A shatul in Hebrew, I forgot what the word is actually even in English, a sapling. A tree, a, a shatul is a tree which has been grown and is now big enough to be permanently planted. So you will be like this little tree that is about to be permanently planted, where? Al palge mayim, on divided waters. And if you do that, then we see all kinds of blessings, which is the end of the verse. But let's take a careful look here accordingly. What does this mean, according to the Malbim, a little baby tree? What's that got to do with you and me? 
it means that at some point in your life, uh, you were a child. I mean, you know, you got parents who will probably give witness to that. And you had little diapers and you had, I mean, if you have your own children, it's a good way to remember it. At this point, I have to like remember my great grandchildren to see something running around in diapers. But once upon a time, I think I also had diapers. So you're a little kid and you're growing up and you're growing up and suddenly you're like learning how to play the game of life. You're probably coming towards being a teenager or into puberty or passage of right to heading towards being an adult. And at some point in that, Ms. Garrett, in that part of your life, maybe it won't happen until you're 45 years old, God forbid, but at some point in that life, you're going to realize it's time to leave the nest and go and claim your own life to be who you are. Your parents, the word for parents in Hebrew is connected to the same word in Hebrew for mountains, horim, ha'arim. Because when you're a little child, the biggest mountains in the world are your parents. But someday you wake up and find out they too were human beings. As Mark Twain once said in such a beautiful way, he said, when I was 14, I thought my dad was a total idiot. And by the time I was 21, I was amazed how much my dad had grown in seven years. So we go through this process of realizing that our parents are just humans and the mountains fade away. And now we have to go and become the parent and the grandparent and all of the rest of it. We have to know where am I going to plant myself? That Malbim says the idea of Palgi Mayim, of the divided waters, teaches us to, there used to be a famous department store in New York City called Barney's. And their tagline was shop, don't settle. Just keep looking until you find what you want. It's the same idea here. Palgi Mayim, go and look at the different places in the world. Look at the different cultures in the world. Look what environment will help you to grow to be who you are. Where will you get the best sunlight? Where will you get the best nutrients from the soil? What will be this, the environment that will impact you in the most positive way? If you plant yourself in the place where you are meant to be, then by doing that, all of the rest of the blessings which continue in that verse will happen. Your leaves will not wither. Everything you will do will be successful and so on. You will be able to find all that is inside of you. Okay. Such a person becomes a fruit-bearing tree. When a person is in the right environment, when a person is doing, the, you know, the word mazal, like mazal tov. So the Gera Rebbe, the Sfat Emet, says the word mazal is an acronym for makom zman la'asot, to be in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. That's what brings you mazal. So if you are now in the right place in the right time, you will have fruit. You will bear fruit. Just like King David says, your fruits will not wither. So now you become a fruit-bearing tree. Watch this. If you become a fruit-bearing tree, as the metaphor infers, war will not harm you. Okay. What's the relationship then with war and the tree? So we're going to take it to the next level. War is not what we're supposed to be about. The Torah says that all war are fought by God. God is called Ish Milchama. We say it even in this week's Parsha in Az Yoshir. He is a man, which man does not mean human, obviously, chas Man is a term of, of victorious at what one does. So therefore, Ish, uh, Hashem as Ish Milchama means that there is nobody who can defeat God in war. He is the man, as we said in New York all the time. So meaning to say that there's none who control war like God. God is all about when there is war. Therefore, every time there is war, chas v'shalom, God forbid, it is coming to fix things that we have failed to be able to fix. Now, it's very interesting. The word for war in Hebrew is milchama. And milchama has in it the word lechem, which means bread. 
We also know that most wars in the world historically were fought over financial reasons. People needed more food or whatever it was. They fought for bread. People, even without war, they go in their own little wars. You know, man walks out the door to go do his business to make his money. He's at war. He's got competitors and all the rest of it. It's war. And so therefore, when a person goes into this level of war, on a simple level, it relates to lechem. But on a much deeper level, whenever the Torah uses the term lechem, it's not referring to spelt. It's referring to wheat. Wheat is called the food of wisdom. The Zohar and the Vilna Gon both point out that the tree that Adam and Eve ate from was a wheat tree. Wheat is that which creates human wisdom. We see this even in Jewish law. A person is walking down the street and there's dog poop on the sidewalk. You're not allowed to make a blessing. You're not allowed to talk Torah in, in the presence of something putrid like that. Well, what about any kind of human poop, right? Anybody's got a, a situation like that. You don't want to have them talk Torah in such a place. So what about when you're holding a baby and the baby drops a little payload into its diaper? What happens then? Is everybody, if you're holding your little baby in the middle of Shmonesa and you hear, what happens then, right? So it's amazing. This is, this. you can open up the Shulchan Aruch. This is Jewish law. This is not Kabbalah. So the law is, calls man all the time that the baby has not eaten wheat products. Let's say the baby is only nursing from the mommy. So then the thing that the baby deposits, it's no problem. You can continue talking Torah. It's only once the baby begins to consume wheat that the baby now has a new level of knowledge. And therefore, excrement is as if it's something that did not reach its proper fulfillment. That's why the body is excreting it. That's why when the Jews for 40 years ate the man, they never went to the bathroom. They did when they ate other foods, but not the man, because the man being angelic food was completely absorbed in the body. There was no waste product. So there all of a sudden, this idea of the original tree of knowledge of good and bad being wheat ties into the word lechem, which ties into the word milchama for war. That with wisdom, without fear of God or knowledge of God, wisdom alone can be a struggle between knowing what is actually good and what is actually bad. And this is our free will, as we're going to get back to what we talked in the earlier part. And we're going to use now the blessing we recite in our Shmona Esrei, in our Armida prayer. This is a teaching from Rabbi Samson Rafael Hirsch. It says as follows, This is the, almost, I think, across the board, every Nusach has this text. Ata, you, meaning God, which is an amazing idea. <laughs> I mean, you would think it's the ultimate arrogance to refer to God as you. When I talk to my rabbi, I would never dream of speaking to him with the word you. I always says, to the rabbi this, to the, I never would say you. But to God, we can just say Atta. It's just phenomenal. Or at least while we're still in this world, we can. So Atta Chonein Ladam Das. You Chonein. Chonein from Lashon Chain. Grace. You lovingly. You God lovingly, freely, without any uh, expectation, if you will. You freely give to Adam Da'at. Wisdom. Okay. Second man, the verse, the, the blessing continues. Ulla made here, it's not chonein, it's not James Joyce free flowing consciousness. Now it's you teach. We'll come back in a second. What's the difference between getting it for free and teaching? But you teach le enosh. Enosh also is another word for man. And we have to understand who is Enosh and why is the difference between Adam and Enosh? 
Why is Adam getting a freebie? And why is Enosh got to uh, go to school? And why is Adam picking up Das and Enosh is picking up Bina? What's the difference between Das and Bina? What's the difference between Adam and Enosh? And what's the difference between freebies and schooling? So Adam is cosmic man. Adam is Aduma from the earth. He is planted. He's planted where he belongs. He's not looking to please other people in his community because he needs validation for his reality. He is real because God made him, full stop. So therefore, he's involved in the community as a participant, as a giver, as a builder, because he's planted. Because he is planted, he's in sync and everything, just like when you plant a tree, it just goes the way it's meant to go. And that's Das. However, Bina is the middle matzah. On, ma on Passover, you have your three matzahs, Chachma, Bina, and Das. Bina is the broken matzah. Enosh was the great-grandson of Adam, who was the first person to introduce idolatry into the world. And therefore, Rabbi Hirsch points out that his name is a combination of two Hebrew words, Onis and Onish. Onus means to be forced, and onish means to be punished. So man who loses the frequency from God, he's off track. He's not where he or she belongs, comes into a state of war. I'm forced, I'm punished, I'm struggling. How does that person get realigned? They have to learn the lessons of life. That's what Bina is all about. Bina is le bonnet, build. They have to understand how to build their life again and do tikkun and fix. Why are they at war? So these two stages of the human being, one is where the lechem, the bread, simply falls from heaven. And the other is where the person has to go into a state of struggle. To understand this, we have to now go back for a minute. I think we might have done this in the last class. So I, I hope I'm not being redundant. But we have to take a look again as to what was the original sin of Adam and Eve. Since you're all muted, I don't know why you are, but since you are, maybe you could not. Did we do all of this? If we did, I can skip over it. Okay, so then, no. Oh, I got a yes. I got a no and I got a yes. Thumbs up means yes, we did. Or thumbs up means go ahead and do it again. Oh, okay, fine. Whatever. <laughs> I agree, Marcus. I'll just do it quickly then. <laughs> I think we are uh, okay. Okay, I'll just do it again slower then. Sorry. Uh, the original, from the Jewish point of perspective, of the original sin was not eating the fruit. Wrong religion. Not eating the fruit. Adam was destined to eat the fruit. This is what we're talking about at the start of the class. It was a sting. It was a setup. There was no way Jose. Wow, that sounds cool when I say that actually the Spanish-speaking people. There was, doesn't sound good to say there was no way Peter. There was no way Jose that Adam was not going to eat the fruit. So that could not have been the sin. He was set up. How can you blame him or her? The sin was after they ate the fruit. They didn't do tshuva. Instead, Adam blames Eve, and Eve blames Vinny, the snake. Nobody took responsibility. Had Adam stood up and said, you know what? You're right. I made a mistake. I apologize. Would have been game over. He would have become Mashiach, because we know that that's his neshama. Adam is Adam, David, Mashiach. It's all the same neshama. And it's all the same Gilgul, reincarnation. He would have become a Shiach, and they would have gone, and it would have all been Shabbat, would have been this Shabbat, and that would have been seven days instead of 7,000 years. So the original sin in one word is chutzpah, arrogance. Bless you. It's arrogance. That's what their mistake was. And that mistake, therefore, means that anybody who does not recognize that we are human and make mistakes must be perfect. And the only person that we know who ever claimed to be perfect was Pharaoh. 
because we know that Pharaoh said he was God. And therefore, we know that Pharaoh never went to the bathroom. That's why we know that God told Moses, go down to the river when Pharaoh's running to get down there at four o'clock in the morning. And, you know, that's probably what the scenario was. Pharaoh, especially as a guy, really got to go when you wake up in the morning. He's bouncing from leg to leg. And Moses pops out and says, all this blah, blah, blah. And Pharaoh's like, what do you want from me? And he says, and Moshe says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, fine, just let me go. And I'll let you guys go, right? So because Pharaoh was God, he didn't go to the bathroom. Guess what? Every single one of the 10 plagues were designed to actually help Pharaoh come back to being a human being. That's why Moshe, according to many of the Hasidim, was angry at Pharaoh in the very end. He was angry because he loved Pharaoh. Moshe grew up in the house with Pharaoh. Moshe was the son of Batya. He knew everybody there. He didn't want to see his brother get killed. He didn't want to see the land of Egypt that he loved get killed. Just think about this. Jews suffered like unbelievable for hundreds of years. And yet the Torah says when it comes to an Egyptian who wants to convert, unlike the Amalekites, that they have to be welcome. Of course, their conditions. But why do they have to be welcome? Because God says you have to remember they hosted you. Hosted you in Nazi Germany? Guess what? Yes. And because of whatever it was, they were our hosts. We still have to focus on that good. So Moshe wanted Paro to do tshuva, but Paro just hardened his heart. Every single time another plague came, the Jewish people became more aware of God, and Paro became less aware. Paro said, who is God that I should listen to him? This is the ultimate avodah idolatry, self avodah when we make ourselves into something that we are not. When we fall into that trap, we are lost and we are not balanced. We are not planted. And that becomes our biggest challenge to be able to understand that. When Adam and Eve, prior to the sin, their free will, another point we have to come back to, was between true and false. It was objective. But after the sin, it became subjective, good and bad. I might say vanilla ice cream is really good. You might tell me it's bad. It's subjective. It's not good or bad. It's just whatever I relate to it. So the tree of knowledge is not the tree of knowledge of true and false. It's the tree of knowledge of good and bad. It's knowledge which can be a double-edged sword. It could be a horrible weapon. We could go over war with each other because my God's greater than your God. And, and millions of innocent people will die because my platform of life is the one that has to rule the world. That's this idolatry to the ultimate. So therefore, when this becomes the problem of this type of idolatry or this challenge within ourselves, this leads us to the level where even Shammai and Hillel, the great Jewish sages, had the longest argument of all their arguments was whether or not man should have been created. And guess what? They come to the conclusion he should not. It would be better not to be born. I don't know if you guys ever got in Mexico. I hope you did. It'd be kind of cool to see what it would look like in Spanish. But one of my favorite cartoonists uh, is Gary Larson, creator of Farside. If you have never seen him, you got to Google him afterwards. But he had a cartoon of a living room with parents and a teenage kid in the living room. And he's really, the teenage kid is angry at his parents and he's pointing his finger at his parents and he says, hey, I didn't ask to be drawn, right? So many times, you know, we say to our parents, hey, I didn't ask to be born. And the truth of the matter is, is that both Shammai and Hillel agree you shouldn't have been. Why? Because unfortunately, very few people in this world succeed at the purpose of this world. Why? Because the world has been set up for failure. So unless you take a proactive control of your life and make the important decisions of your life that will impact you and your children and all of your future generations, 
we're losers. I'll show you another example. King Solomon says, I will loosely translate, A, there is no Sadiq, a holy person in the world who has not sinned, which is really an amazing idea. Because if he's a holy person, then why did he sin? It also goes on to say that there is a holy person will sin seven times, will fall seven times and get up eight times. Really? Really? What kind of holy? You know, in today's world, if a rabbi falls once, he's slaughtered. The Lush and Hara destroys him. Nobody gives a benefit of the doubt. Everybody's guilty until proven even more guilty. It's a horrible situation. But in those days, you can fall seven times and you still call him a tzaddik? The answer is yes, because the definition of a tzaddik is not a saint. That's not our religion. The definition of a tzaddik comes from the word tzad. In Hebrew, it means S-I-D-E, side. That every time this person, man or woman, is going through a choice, they're always trying to push themselves to the side of Kedusha, Sadi Kuf, to the side of holiness. But as a human being, he or she will fail. And, and, and because the person will fail, they will have to get themselves back up again. That's the challenge. Because the challenge is that, yes, we will fail, but we get back up again. By the way, if you look at how the word tzaddik is written, it's the letter tzaddi, which is the numerical value of 90. And it's also the very next letter, which is kuf, which is the value of 100. And kuf, 100, always represents the idea of perfection. So the tzaddi, to create the name tzaddik, has to take the letter kuf and add it to the letter tzaddi to make tzaddik, because that person's always reaching for perfection. And as Winston Churchill once said, success is what comes to you after a series of failures. So therefore, when the tzaddik is falling, the holy person falls, not only are they not deterred, but they actually realize this is the necessary path to success. That's the process that we go through. And this comes now back to our next question we had asked. Why was the moon shrunk? Why did the moon get punished? The answer is as follows. We know that when God first created the world, it was through judgment. Judging is perfect. Therefore, right, Baruch Dayan Emet, the true judge. Therefore, in truth, really there can be these two lights. But in the world of free will, there can't be. So it wasn't that the moon chapped a chiddish. It didn't come up with some brilliant thing that God had, oops, forgotten. That was the process. First, God created the perfect world, which is the name Elohim, where everything is just. And therefore, both lights shine. But now that it's going to move in the world of Hashem Elohim, where there's going to be this free will, then the moon had to be shrunk. Why? What is the moonlight? The moonlight is only a reflection of the sunlight. So therefore, the moon's light becomes like the moon, a game of hide and go seek. Good night, moon. I'm sure you guys all read that book to your children, or maybe you had it when you were a kid yourself. Good night, moon by Mrs. Brown. Beautiful children's book if you've never seen it. But sometimes the moon is full. Sometimes the moon is a new moon. You can't see it. I mean, one of my greatest rabbis who had a very Spanish name known as Jerry Garcia from the Grateful Dead, he once said it, sometimes the light's all shining on me and other times I can barely see. So that's the free will. Sometimes the light is clear. You know exactly what to do. You're in the sink of creation. And other times it's completely hidden and you don't know what's going on and where are you and where are you going? That's the beauty of the world we are in. That's why the moonlight had to be shrunk because the whole world in Hebrew is called olam. Olam comes from the Hebrew word alam, which means hidden. 
This whole world is a hide-and-go-seek game to find God. The worst thing, of course, I don't know if you, when I was a little kid, we used to like have 50 kids in my community. We play hide-and-go-seek. For some reason, nobody ever bothered to come find me. Maybe because I found too good a hiding place. And like, wow, it's getting dark out. Nobody, you know, and I finally like come out, found that everyone's already gone home. That's like how God would feel if you don't bother to look for him. God creates you, births you, sustains you, puts you in your life and world, and nobody makes the effort to go look for God. That's what this world is. It's hide and go seek. And that's why the moon had to be the one that was able to be able to shrink. On the other hand, all of our inner essence are tzaddik. As the Torah says, kol Yisrael tzaddikim. We are all holy. The challenge is if we can fulfill that holiness, then we become like that fruit tree. This is why, sorry, one second. Okay. This is why the tikkun olam is tshuva. Tshuva does not mean to repent. Tshuva simply means to return. It means to go back to being who we are. And in being who we are, it means to be centered. This is answering now Rashi's point. Why did Rashi find it important to tell us that the tree of life, which is also the tree of knowledge of good and bad, had to be in the center of the garden? Because that's where we need to be. We need to be centered. As long as we are centered, that will be like King David said, we will have fruit and we will be free from war and confusion in our lives. <clears throat> the next question we asked was, why did it use that term, call eights? Why did it use the word eights in the singular? Well, we answered it on one level because the Zohar said that both trees were really the same tree. But on a much deeper level, the Zohar tells us that actually Adam and Eve were going to eat from the tree when on Shabbat. But the problem was they ate on Friday. <clears throat> Had they eaten on Shabbat, it would have been the tree of life. But because they ate on Friday, it was, let's call it the tree of confusion instead of life. And what is the difference between the two? The difference reflects our, our souls filled with self-worship of idolatry? Or are we filled with the idea of serving God? If a person is only about themselves, then everything is now. I want it now. I want instant gratification. I want it now. Adam and Eve could not wait. If it's about serving Hashem, then it's patience for the process. I'm going to digress for a minute, but it's a beautiful Torah that I think uh, you, hopefully, it might change your whole life, change my life. But it's very relevant to what we're talking about. The Gomorrah asks two verses that King Solomon wrote seemingly conflict with each other. This has to do with getting married. It says, Matzah uh, Isha Matzah Tov. I found a woman. It could also be I found a husband. I found a partner and I found goodness. The other verse says, Matzah Ani Marmi Mavat Eta Isha. I found that the woman was more bitter than death, right? Like, shoot me, please. Like, I, I, I'd rather die than be in this marriage. The woman was worst thing ever happening. And the Talmud says that actually became a custom when a man would get married, they would come over and they would say to him, Motza Matza, referring to these two verses, because one uses the verb Motza, I found it, Matza, I found. Meaning, are you happy with your marriage? Actually, there's a joke like that. In, uh, in, the one, in the Mir Yeshiva in Europe, before World War II, because of poverty, men often would learn until they were 40 or 45 years old before they got married. Because once they got married, they had the responsibility of the finances of the home. That would be the end of their learning. So this one guy gets married. And after a week or two, he comes back to the Yeshiva. And all the single men gather around. And they're so excited to hear from him. Wow, what's it like to be married at 45? What's it like? 
And he says, oh, it's wonderful. If I had known it was this good, I would have been married at 42. Anyhow, so these two verses seem to conflict with each other. How can you say, I found the woman and I found greatness? And then the next sentence you turn around and say, I found the woman to be worse than death. So the Gomorrah explains beautifully, as explained also by uh, Rabbi Ginsburg. It's as follows. Carefully look at the verse. Motza ani, I found the woman more bitter than death. Motza ani is I found. Why did I get married? Because I wanted to have a trophy of a beautiful woman I could put on my shelf. I wanted somebody who clean my clothes. I wanted somebody who would be next to me in my bed. I wanted somebody who's going to raise my children. I, 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 I. Oh. If that's how you go into a marriage, amigo, Booker Tov, you're in for a big wake up, especially when you find out that your little beautiful China doll robot wife happens to be a human being with her own personality. Good morning. So if you go into the marriage looking for what you're going to find, yeah, you're going to find a big wake up call. However, in the other verse, it doesn't say that. It says, Matza Isha, Matza Tov. If you go into a marriage, what kind of chesed, what kind of kindness can I do for this woman? How can I, you know, I always say, if you want to be a king of your house, make sure you made your wife the queen. So how can I bless her? How can I take care of her? How can I recognize, as the Gemara says, that all my blessings and my wife is going to be from her? Even if they're just my children, that's in itself already phenomenal. So Matzah Isha, if you go in to discover who this person is, you talk to this person as a human being and then ultimately as an angel, then you are guaranteed that you will find Tov. That's how it resolves this. I know it's a little bit of a digression, but I just felt it was important here because this is the same idea as well. When we talk about the question, how can there be free will if God knows everything? Well, really, the answer is that the only free will we have, if any of you guys are software programmers, you'll probably appreciate this better. But in software, when you have your flow chart, you come down to your diamond where you have your zero one, your binary decision of choice. That's your free will. It's either yes or no. You're either in sync or out of sync. It doesn't mean what you're actually doing with your hands and how events are occurring. That's just all part of the theatrical makeup to make you believe you're in a world of free will. But everything, everything is under control, except for here. This is why you wear the tefillah on the head. It's yashar kel, straight to God, is the word Israel. Otherwise, you break the circuit. So when the flow chart comes down, if it hits the one, then the flow continues. If it hits the zero, to borrow now instead of software language, let's use a little Kabbalah, then it has to go back and be reincarnated until it gets it right and then continues. But it's only that, that space in the synapse of the brain where free will exists. That's it. You're either in the Ratzon of Hashem with God or not. That's it. Those split seconds of every decision we make, and as a result of every decision, it takes us into higher and lower worlds and all the rest of the things that we acquire in this world. That's why it's called call ha'etz, all of the tree, because the word call is the same letters as the word lech, as in lech lecha. Go out to the split waters of the world and find out where you should be planted, because lech, go, there's only one place you could ever go, Lecha, in yourself. Bakol mi kol kol. It's all inside of you. Kol means all. And lech lecha is the numerical value of 100. So therefore, it's that level of perfection. And it's through this process of trying to perfect ourselves. It's the trying to perfect that is perfect. We will not be perfect. Only God is perfect. Our perfection is perfecting is by trying, is by making that effort. So that's why it's call it eights. And now we'll finish the class on one more thought. If you have the, uh, the uh, page that was given out, 
If not, I'll just help you with it. We have uh, a Mishnah, the first Mishnah in the Gomorrah in uh, Rosh Hashanah. And Marcos, if I may ask you, are you comfortable? Do you understand Hebrew? Okay. Would you be comfortable enough to read the Mishnah for us? You yes. Say, oh, great. I always like a victim, a volunteer. Okay. Arwa Rashesh Anim Hem. Behad Venisan Rosh Hashanah Le Melahim Be Le Raglaim. Revi Lazar Berri Shimon Umrim Behad Betishre. Behad Betishre Rosh Hashanah Le Shanim Be Lashmitin Be La Yoblot Lantia Be La Irakot. Behad Bailur Rosh Hashanah Le Masar Beame Beema. Behad Shibish. Behad Bishvat Rosh Hashanah Lailan, Kedibre Bet Shamai Bet Ilel Omrim, Behamishe Asar Bo. Excellent. So basically, what did we see? There are four New Years, right? Four New Years. Only Jews would come up with four New Years because it was so neurotic. <laughs> I mean, seriously, right? Go talk to the Mexican government about, hey, little guy. Go talk to the Mexican government about installing another three New Year's in the calendar. But, but Jews, of course, you know, we have to have four New Year's. What, Marcus, I need you to demute for a minute, please. What was the fourth New Year that you read? Uh, in, in Shvat. Right. And what for is the, that? For the, it's for the Ilanot. Right. For the new trees. Two Shvat. Beis Shammai says it starts on Rosh Chodesh, on the new moon. And Beis Hillel says, which we're happening right now, it's on the 15th of, of the month. Right, Chamesh says the 15th of the month. That's where two is 15 in Hebrew, two bit of Shvat, two bit Shvat. Tell me what's wrong with that sentence, even no matter how weak your Hebrew is. That sentence you read has a mistake It says Behad at the beginning and at the end Bahamisha. Okay, that's interesting, but that actually happens to be okay. What you you actually said it yourself. You didn't realize it that you fell into this mistake, which is kind of why I asked for a volunteer. It's always more fun. What does it say this is the new year of? Again, one more time. What is this a new year for? The fourth new year. What is new Tubishvat celebrating? The new year of Lailan. Oh Lailan. What's that word? No, it's it's not it's not it's, but it's also not. You said it correctly the first time. It should be Elanot trees. Ah, oh, but the Mishnah doesn't say that. It says it's the new year of the tree. Right? Kind of strange. The new year of the tree, the tree. And again, remember we asked that question before. Call eight. Is only one tree? Why does the Mishnah say one tree? So the Arizal on this Mishnah points out because it's referring to the tree of life. It's referring to the tree in the center of the world. And this answers our last question. Why the heck, which was our first question, why the heck would you celebrate trees in February or the end of January. Celebrate it when they're filled with fruit, like the Bikurim. Why? When it's, well, I wish, but it should be snowing outside. It's certainly raining. It's cold and all the leaves have fallen down and the trees look miserable. And this is what you're going to celebrate the trees. Are we making fun of the trees? So our sages tell us an amazing agricultural reality that when you plant the seed of a tree in the ground, what happens to that seed under the ground? It actually begins to fall apart. It deteriorates. It's almost to the point where there's no seed left. And an amazing miracle happens. At some moment, the process reverses itself and the seed begins to be mechubar, begins to reattach itself and from that point on, under the ground, the tree is now starting to grow. 
So it tells us an amazing thing. It tells us even if we're in a world where everything is set up against us for our failure, it's okay. And even if we see our whole world coming apart because we look on the surface and the trees look miserable, it's okay. And even if our last hope, which is this little seed, is falling apart, it's okay. Because with a munah, with a faith, that little seed will turn around no matter what it looks like on the outside and will begin to grow. And that is the miracle of life. That's why it's called the tree of life. It's Chaim. Because each one of us have inside of ourselves this tree planted. And therefore, Tu B'Shvat comes to teach us a lesson. Trees don't have free will. When trees didn't listen to the will of God, they were not, not listening to the will of God. They were going into the hidden phase where you wouldn't see that the tree itself is the fruit. Only when the Mashiach comes will we then really see people because what is our skin, which is spelt in Hebrew with the word ayin for skin or will go back to be spelt with an aleph, which means light. You'll be able to see inside of everybody. You'll be able to see the holy tselem elokim, the image of God in everybody. You will see that not only did they do things in their lives of fruits of actions, but they themselves became a fruit tree, the original language of the fruit tree, but only at the time when man does tikkun olam. And that is why we know that there have been three exiles and there will be three redemptions. The first one happened on the 15th of Nisan. That was coming out of Egypt. The second one, roll it back 50, 30 days earlier, is Purim, the second incoming. And the third one, roll it back 30 days, is Tu B'Shvat. That in the final rectification where there will be, as Isaiah Ishayahu says, we will take our weapons and we will turn them into tools of building this world. There will be no more war because we will be planted in the center of our garden. And from the center, we grow. So I bless you all. Happy New Year. Shana Tova. Uh, make sure to find a fruit uh, that you haven't eaten so that you can make a bracha of Shekhianu that has kept us alive so that we should live even if we go through holocaust even if we go through darkness am yisrael chai david melech yisrael chai chai vikayam and so we are all a part of this tree of life we just need to figure out how each one of us can be who we are it's all god wants god doesn't want you to be a superstar you may be a superstar but it's a side product God wants you to just be who you are because each of us is precious. And when we remember that, we bring peace into the world. So, muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Really, really deep. Really amazing. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, amigo. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to go now back to this side of the world. <laughs> <laughs> I send Bye. you the day. I send you the Bye. day that we already lived. It's a, a good day. Bye, everybody. Amen. Bye.